Hey everybody, I just finished up an interview with Kurt from Dotronics, who's one of the last remaining people manufacturing CRTs for use in mostly museums and things like that. Now, normally this is the type of interview that I would never want to do over Skype. I would want to be there with my cameras, walking through the facility, and really seeing all this stuff firsthand. So unfortunately, with everything going on in the world, we're stuck with a Skype interview, which means the audio is not that great. There's that awkward delay where sometimes you step on each other, but uh, I do want to get back there and do something in person. So this this time, uh, it's just kind of an overview of what Kurt does and his history. Also, just to put it into perspective, he the monitors that you're going to be hearing us talk about are video wall monitors, which were mostly used in museums and stuff like that. And there were many companies making them, and they all looked very similar. So while you might see things that look like these monitors still floating around, they might not be of the same quality. So I just wanted to say that first, because when you hear some of the things we talk about, you may have picked up up one of those leftover museum monitors that were going around for 200 bucks in the past year or two. Um, and while it looks the same, these are definitely of higher quality. So uh, just keep that in mind in the interview if you've already seen one of these. If you don't, or if you haven't, then what I just said is just rambling and doesn't make sense. So I'll quit talking. Uh, and without further ado, here's Kurt from Dotronics. Hey everybody, I am here with Kurt from Dotronics, who might be one of the last people on the planet still making brand new CRTs. Is uh, that about correct? I, I would probably venture best to say yes, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I got familiar with your work because of the CRTs that you make for museums and stuff like that. Um, but I think the, the crowd that will be listening to this really probably wants to hear everything so <laughs> start start from the beginning if you wouldn't mind and, and please just tell us a little bit about yourself and dotronics and um and how and why you ended up here because everybody that listens to this is a, a giant fan of crts uh and we love to hear stuff like this yeah it, it depends how far back you want to go so it, it's uh I, I started in the crt business it's been a family business over the years and i started back in 10th grade oh wow and uh, <laughs> I, I, it's all I've done my whole life, and, and I've been around, I'm not an engineer myself, but I've been around brilliant engineers my whole life, that, that, that no video deflection in CRT technology, and they come from the vacuum tube era, and they've worked, worked their way through the, the diode era, mm -hmm. so they really understood that. My father was a was self-taught electrical engineer, so he, he essentially, uh, way back in the, during the Apollo days, uh, the Apollo mission right, yeah. program, if you go down to Cape Canaveral, and look at their the, the thing where they bring the uh, consumers to see the, the simulation of the of launch. Mm -hmm. All those displays are my father's. He built those in his basement. Oh wow! So that's how far back that goes. And he essentially was the first solid state display that NASA used with diodes and transistors. Although it was before that, it would have been vacuum tubes. So that's kind of that's what I grew up under. If, if, if we I wasn't out doing baseball. I was making electronics up with dad and blowing stuff up and. He, it was a whole different childhood for me. So people go, you know, like baseball shut down. It's like, I don't care. I'd rather <laughs> electronics. I'm not, just not, I like sports, but not to that extent. So, um, so that's kind of where I've, I've always been in an engineering family. And I, I'm not a degree engineer myself, so I have a bunch of them that help me if I get stuck someplace. I've got EEs around that can pull me out of the trouble because mm -hmm. that just wasn't my forte. I'm actually a degree meteorologist, if you of all things. Oh, really? Huh. So I went to school. I've got enough physics and electrical background to – to do this, but um, I just decided that when I came out of school, I just said, you know, it was a recession, couldn't get jobs anywhere, so I just started working in the stockroom with the business, and then it just grew my way up, and then back in in about 2003, my father passed away, I, I, I took over the company, and then we took it private in 05, and didn't sell my first monitor to a museum until 07. Oh, wow, okay. So it, it it was a was a market that just wasn't on our radar. It, other businesses and other manufacturers were making CRTs, and that that satisfied their niche. Obviously, when flat panels came along, that all changed. I just happened to be in a position with with warehouses full of CRTs and electronics. You know, the tens of thousands of different parts that you some you can't get anymore. Mm -hmm. We're sitting there, and I thought, what am I going to do? Am I just going to trash it, go find another job? Or and all of a sudden, Museum of Modern Art came along mm -hmm. uh, in seven. And uh, they wanted to do a five by five video wall, and they, no one else, you know, Sony, Mitsubishi, Pan, they were all gone. Mm -hmm. They, they were out of the CRT business. 
we had stackable video wall monitors that I could still produce. Well, that kind of started. Once I put that in, from there, it just exploded. They, they realized, hey, this guy's still around. You can still do it. And I essentially don't have anybody else producing the stuff. So um, that's kind of how, how the evolution of Dotronics went to where I'm at today. Um, uh, it's, it's the strongest it's ever been for demand and supply, obviously, is, is low. So uh, at some point, I'm going to run out of material. Um, <laughs> you, can't, you can't buy it. Anymore. So what was the company's focus throughout uh, its lifespan up until then? Is it for, uh, was it commercial only or was it, did you have consumer TVs strictly, that you made? Strictly, strictly commercial. So it would have been medical care, it would have been arrival departure monitors at airports. We had mm. heavily in that huge medical presence from MRIs to CAT scans to ultrasounds, uh, ATM machines, all kinds of things we produced. Because in the old days, uh, every signal source had to have a, a monitor designed for that signal. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates came along in the early 80s and standardized video signals for computers. Well, then all of the other manufacturers decided, okay, we're going to adopt those frequencies. Then, then they could mass produce displays without having to make every, you know, we have probably 4,500 different displays we made at one time. Wow. Well, you know, we did the, like Medtronics, we did affordable defibrillators, that little, do you remember the, I don't know your age, but uh, remember the William Shatler's 911 program yeah. back when? Yes. They would show a little blip on the heart monitor. Yes. Those are our displays. Those are little five inch displays we made for, for actually it was called physio control. Now it's Medtronics. They bought them out mm -hmm. years ago. And now it's all flat panels. Yeah. You know, once flat panels came, it wiped out the business. So there's, all the monitored people are out of the business. So I don't know of anybody, but maybe one's doing some nine inch work for some custom mm -hmm. uh, product. But other than that, it's just even all my suppliers are pretty much gone. They, they, they just don't sell the raw material anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so fortunately, I, I, I saw that coming, bought a lot of material, uh, just speculation that, hey, I could use this stuff. And, and that's, you know, now those sources are gone. I can't buy that anymore. So. When I run out of my material, uh, then I, you know, I go fishing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, dealing with retro gaming stuff, I mean, I know exactly what you mean by that. Cause if you can't get certain parts anymore, you have to figure out how to make your own, you know, how close yeah. of a replacement can you make it where it's still going to be considered the original device, stuff like that. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting. So essentially that's how we evolved to this. And once MoMA was installed, you know, obviously other curators go through and, 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 uh, see that, hey, would you get this? And then it just, it just spread. So I'm, I'm shipped all over the world right now. I'm, I'm down in China, New Zealand. Mm. I've actually got a bid going out to Russia. Oh, cool. So I mean, it's all over the world that they're looking for this stuff because you just can't get it. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the supply is going to not be enough to meet demand at some point. And they're even, all these museums are trying to decide what are we going to do when this is, when this, when we can't get raw material anymore and get product. Mm. And, we're still working on that. How do they how do they continue showing these pieces of work without a physical display? You know. Yeah, funny. That's that's how we met. For everybody listening, is a friend of mine works for museums and contacted me about hey, how could we how could we replace CRTs for hey, some of them will never be able to be replaced for certain things, but for others, what's the best way to go around that? And we were trying to figure out a bunch of different things, but uh, yeah, it's the the look of a CRT, I don't know if it'll ever truly be able to be reproduced. Um, I mean, it's, I always try to describe it as best I can, but maybe you could add something to this because sometimes I'm not so good at it, but it's the image is drawn by a beam of light on the back of a piece of glass. So any space between, especially for video games where there's a lot of undrawn areas, we sometimes refer to them as scan lines, even though the actual data is really the scan lines, but whatever. Um, you're actually looking through glass at empty space. So especially when you're playing a video game, you get that that odd sense of depth that you can't quite notice in the same way you don't notice that your persistence of vision is seeing the image being drawn, but it's a different feel. And even things like uh, TV shows that were shot in 480i60 for, for television, watching those on a TV, on a CRT TV, always feels much different than on a flat panel. Um, so there's just you know whether whether people care or not is a different story but in the future there's certainly going to be people that don't know how some of these games and shows ever were supposed to look because in, in crts are, are getting harder to find yeah yeah so yeah no exactly so it, it's uh, what i hear from all my customers mainly in the museum industry we just don't have the look and feel uh, and, and a lot of these where they've they've these artists have made these videos on old CRT based technology, it, it's like John Rembrandt to change its canvas. It just, it won't be the same. So they got to have it on the original device. So 
the highest demands in my curved product, my curved glass product, which is going to come to then sooner than the other stuff. I got a lot of flat glass product that as the evolution of the industry changed, everything was curved. And when flat panel came, the CRT industry tried to compete, so they made flat glass. Right. So the same. And then eventually that was a very short period of time that that happened. Then it just dropped off the flat panel. So, uh, yeah, you don't get the static, the, the, the hum, you know, the radiation, all that, it's the feel that you get out of a CRT that you just flat panels just don't have it. So, yeah. Uh, so that, and I'd say it's it's just one of those. I think it's a technology eventually that will just be in the archives. It, you won't. No one will be able to produce a CRT again inexpensively. It's just that's that's an industry, very complex industry process, and all the people that did are getting old and dying off. And if they're not teaching it in school, uh, it would be a monumental task to, to to make all the components for glass and the devices that need to like the flexion yokes to make it deflect. It just that's. You can't wind those in the basement. That's just it's a highly precision machine process, and and they're all the yoke guys are all gone. I mean, those are, that's another that was a whole separate industry to the glass. You know. So. Yeah, I actually read an article a few years ago. Is there uh, probably more than a few years ago now? But there was one company in China that was going to be the last big manufacturer of CRTs, and they sold off everything, the equipment, to another company who couldn't figure out how to get the windings right. So there's just a bunch of stock of stuff sitting there. Somebody contacted me about it a few years ago, like, hey, that stuff's still there if you know anybody that wants to make them. But the problem is, I don't think people realize that that $300 flat panel TV that you get from Amazon or Best Buy, if that wasn't made in a billion dollar facility, you know, 100,000 at a time, that would be a $2,000 monitor minimum. So it's volume. Yeah, it's the yeah. same with CRTs. So, you know, if, if that CRT that you got for 300 bucks, you know, in 2000, that would have been a, you know, $2,500, $3,000 CRT if it was not a major assembly line process. Well, they, they've got where they make the substrates for the flat panels over in Korea. They have a clean room that's 2 million square feet, just a clean room. Wow. Alone inside of another building, 2 million. Your, your big grocery stores are what, 100,000 square feet? Mm. They got 20 of those just to be a clean room. Then they have a building around that. So it, it's an immense process. That's why they're so cheap now. And now they're making them out of plastic. There's no more glass substrates. They're all plastic now. So they're lighter and cheaper and faster. And now they're throwaway. Yeah. You know, so I get people call me all the time for a repair of flat times. By the time I turn my labor on and buy the part, you can buy a new one. Right. So you just, you just got to recycle them or whatever they do with them. So I, I don't, I, I've never touched flat panels. You can try to distribute them because it's just a crazy business. So. Yeah, I'd rather stay in a small niche business. So, yeah, it, it uh, yeah, you won't do windings. Even and most of the people that, that I know that are engineers that help me are, are in their eighties. <laughs> so, so I, I, it all has a limited lifespan for me. Even if I got, if they were to pass, and you know, that, that I'm, lo- I got a few people I can draw from yet. That that if if I get to that technical problem, like you know, it's nice to have those EDs because you can do all kinds of fun stuff with CRTs that that I I can't I can't engineer. So, <laughs> but they can. So. Yeah, that works out. luckily there's a, a, a growing group of enthusiasts that want to keep this stuff alive. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm not nearly as smart as my friends are, but uh, there are at least a group of people that are trying to understand how these things work, how to repair them, and how to make sure that, you know, as long as the tube still works, we could enjoy CRTs for, for that period of time. So, but you're right. I mean, it's important that this info gets passed down, and at least it's easier nowadays. You know, you could yeah. do a podcast like this and talk to somebody for a while and get that information saved forever. So... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it's uh, you know I'm, I'm I probably got a couple maybe a couple three years left of inventory to service this industry, and then at that point it's going to get a little dicey because my even the places I was finding glass is even the unusual glass places you wouldn't even go look. Like I found I found a batch of 150 brand new CRTs buried in the hay in a barn. Wow. <laughs> I go, well, send me one of those and if I can make it work and if it's, you know, it's, the glass is a perfect vacuum. There's not, nothing inside is going to get hurt. Right, yeah. The glass outside is easy to clean up unless it's scratched. You know, that's even, a, so I, sure enough, I shipped them in and they work great and after I clean them up, they're a brand new product, zero hour product. So That's awesome. But those kind of finds are, it's almost like storage wars, you know. Right, <laughs> it's yeah. It's like, I, I need to find these things and there's just not a lot around. I did find a, a large batch of uh uh, 17 inch color glass, but that's just something that's not a high demand. They had like 5,000 tubes ago. I just, I, I don't want to buy those and stick them in a warehouse and hope I can sell those because it's an odd size, you know. And, yeah. You know, 100 of them would be great, but uh, it, it takes a lot to design the board to drive that tube with the deflection, and there's a lot of engineering to it. So far beyond what I know. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated than people think. Um, so you're 
I guess the best way to describe your monitors then would be uh, professional video monitors where you needed extra detail. So not just a consumer TV where you'd throw in composite video. You needed something like a monitor, something something that people could get, especially for the medical imaging stuff, right? Yeah, that that took it. You know, it, you, you have a whole batch of engineers to do the, the the specifications and how tight the specs have to be for, say, a medical monitor is extremely higher than what a gaming monitor would be. Mm -hmm. You know, their tolerances on linearity and geometry. You know, your doctor's looking at a tumor. It can't be oval. It's got to be round. And so they're, uh, they're much more complex. I mean, uh, the basic gaming monitors and basic, you know, consumer stuff, they use a device called a flyback, which generates the high voltage. Mm -hmm. In medical monitors, they actually have a high voltage power supply that's designed that's probably uh, 300 times more expensive than the flyback. Wow. So when this something changes, the image doesn't move at all. So you know, you know it's in a flyback, you change brightness levels, it'll it, the picture will change size a little bit. Yes. That's all regulation. The flybacks won't regulate, but high voltage will. So that's more tech than you probably want to know. But no, this, so that's, that's exactly of, the type of stuff we want to hear. <laughs> so the what we do here is is all flyback based stuff. All the technical all my medical stuff is pretty much gone. Uh, the stuff we do for museums doesn't have that tight of tolerance. They just want it to look pretty and have to fit the image and, and display it and has to have good purity and, and good color. Uh, uh, the geometry isn't all that critical, you know, not down to you know fractions of a percent. If it wasn't percent, two percent would be more than enough for, for most most users. They wouldn't. Your eye can't see it, you know. So, um, but yeah. So most of what we do here is I do a lot of industrial displays still for people that have old equipment that can't get a flat panel in there. And I'll do those for them and keep them up. Uh, you know, there's, there's 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 paper cutters I deal with. There's big blast furnaces. So there's a little side old business monochrome business that I keep going. Uh, it's almost hobby levels. It's not not eight hours a day kind of thing. So museum business is, is the biggest piece of my business. That's where I do the the large screen color for them, and that's that's that'll go on for a while. Mm. Uh, like say until I run out of glass. So. <laughs> Now, um, flyback versus the uh, the power supply, the high end power supply ones. Um, line count TVL still has has some kind of uh, effect on how much detail is able to be drawn on the screen, right? Uh, on, on monochrome, no. On monochrome, it's it's all based on electronics and how small you can make the spot size. Interesting. So, the higher frequency, the smaller spot you can because there's no shadow mask on a monochrome CRT. Mm -hmm. If you're talking color, then you're limited. All color glass. Have shadow masks that have triads, and that's why you, you know the pixels by the uh, length by width, if you will. And uh, so uh, you can't create. That's a fixed number of pixels. You can't change that. So when they say you can get a higher resolution, yeah, they can. They can. You can drive it, but you're not going to get the resolution because you can't create more physical triads. In a, in a monochrome CRT, it's just it's just painted phosphor and solver. It's, it's how good that gun is designed and how small a spot size you can make based on the frequency. So if you can make a smaller line, smaller spot. You can write more lines. Hmm. So that's why, and I, uh, with a high voltage power supply, that's more that's more of, of a regulation issue to keep things stable. Uh, it's the electronics that drive the frequency to what spots. And if you get higher up, you need better yokes. And it, you're you're getting beyond my engineering capabilities. You'd, you'd have to have an engineer to really describe how that all works. Hmm. But that's kind of the but monochrome is completely different than color. So uh, just like your flat panel on your CR, on your on your uh, laptop. That's got a fixed number of, of intersections. You can't get any more, or any less. It's just what it is. So, uh, but uh, on like the monochrome, we have the one I have over here running with the pattern. That I don't have it. Right, right. But the one with the, with the hash, hash tags on it there. That's 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 a monochrome 12 inch. So that is that that one's running 15750. It's just a low frequency basic monitor. So, uh, but. You, that's that has there are no there are no shadow masks on that monitor. It's just a sprayed phosphor in the in the spot size, whatever it's going to be for that frequency is what you get. And obviously, it's refreshing at a rate that your eye can't see. Obviously, that's why it works. Right. So, but, but uh, that's that's kind of the difference between the two. So the high voltage power supplies were only used really in real high end applications, medical applications, things where you really had to have high voltage regulation, which. Uh, I don't know if you can even buy them anymore. Mm. I mean, at the one time we, I've still got a bunch in stock, but I don't know what to do with them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not you. I can't. There's no reason to use them. They're, they're really. Boring. It's like you know putting a Lamborghini engine in a Honda. It's just a, <laughs> you know. Right. So what are the what so, are the line counts on your color monitors that you still sell though? What are the museums getting? They're, they look because um, I've seen them in person and they certainly look better than your your, your standard consumer grade TV at the same size. Uh, they, yeah, consumer can be you know the, obviously the consumer grade stuff. They're they're, they're making 
they they in the past they designed it just to get the basics out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, these are still really uh, uh, they're still uh, low frequency monitors. Not anything to do with HD. This is still the old NTSC standard that's produced in these old CRTs. Uh, they're not a they're not a VGA SVGA kind of setup. Mm -hmm. or, uh, so you're getting 525 lines. It's just the especially in my flat glass that I have in the behind me. They're just well. It's just as time went on, they designed better and better too. If you look at the 70s tube, they were kind of fuzzy and you know. The time goes on, technology grew, and obviously the, the flat panels, the flat CRT is the last one they really produced, and they got away from the curve. So uh, it all has to do with setup and purity and color setup and uh, how well the flyback works with the with the tube for focus and things like that. So that's all uh, you can tweak all that to make it look as good as you can. And it, it, but over time, you'll see them get fuzzy and dimmer, and that's just how CRCs kind of burn out over time. Right. So that and you can't fix that now. There used to be people that would read gun tubes. You cut the neck off, put a new, you know, pull a, put a new neck on it, pull a vacuum, and be going. You can even wash the phosphor, but all those people are gone too. You know, they're the ones that we need right now. That would be ideal because you could, although you have to have the gun manufacturers. The CRT gun still has to be made. And who's doing that? Right. Why would you build? No, there's no demand. There's no. There's no customers for it. Yeah. I'm not big. Keep anybody alive. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That, you know, and it used to be a percent you were a parasite on the consumer business, consumer TV market. Is where how monitor companies existed because mm -hmm. the consumers watch like in the United States 88 million televisions a year. Uh, you know, we we're lucky if we did 10,000 displays, you know, so a year. So it was you can so we could buy cheap parts off the bigger consumer industry. Exactly. Now that, that there's nowhere to get your parts, you know, it's, it's just gone. So yeah, you know, that's the one thing we're running into too is there's a lot of people that are smart enough to to redesign pretty much every board inside a CRT, but not the glass, not, you know, not not uh, not fix anything like burn in or, or color or uh, when the guns get out of line so that, you know, usually uh, red I, I'm able to see more or more often starts to drift away from the others and, you know, you start to really get that and, you know, without even if you replace every component but the tube you're still totally, you know, out of yeah, luck with that. Tube is a weak link. Once it's wore out, it's wore out. Yeah, you can't. You, and, and if you could find some rebuilders and they had guns, you know, that would be slick. But I, no one looked that far ahead. Even even Doc Price said, "Well, why don't we go acquire that guy that did that, get the knowledge, and, and stock all these gun type? But you don't even have a, the, the, you don't know what kind of glass you're going to have. Right. You know, so the guns are all different. They're all designed a little bit different for each each neck, and you know, within manufacturers are similar, but different manufacturers do different things. So it would have been hard to speculate, do that, and make sure you got the right stuff to drive it. And it's it's quite complex. You know, everything's got to match, and it's all you know that the monochrome one I have there, all that all those components are matched to make that work. But I could change the yoke, and now it would look awful because it's not matched. So. Right. There's a lot of engineering, more than I care to understand <laughs> how to make those things work. So. Yeah, to keep it going, you would essentially have to make every single piece from the glass to, you know, to, to the electronics to, you know, build your own or uh, do your own that, winding. That's, it's not, not practical in my volume mm. at all. It, so. Now, are the CRTs you use, do they come pre-wound or do you guys have to wind them yourselves? Say that again. I, did, I missed the term. The, the CRTs that you get, the actual tubes, do they come pre-wound? Like, do the ones that you still have stock of, or did you have to wind them in order to make it work with your flybacks and, and everything else? Well, the, there's 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 two ways you can get glass. Uh, either they call it you can have you have you can buy a CRT that what they call already yam. It's already got a deflection yoke on the back, and it's it's been mounted by the manufacturer, Phillips or Thompson or somebody else that used to manufacture glass. RCA. They all had big glass plants. It all depends on how the manufacturer wanted to produce. Well, they they they'd match the yoke to the tube and set it up so it's exactly lined. Your purity and your and your job you're all set. And then the manufacturer just builds electronics and matches it up. You know, he, he'll design his board to match the the, the characteristics of the yoke. Mm -hmm. And then you go. There's other ones we we do in both ways. You buy raw glass with nothing on it, just the just the CRT complete. You buy the yoke separately, and you put the yoke on, and then you and we do that internally. You you do all the yam. You put the yoke on and get it all aligned and get it fixed, and then put it. So there's two different ways to do it. Uh, when you have bonded yokes, it's tough because when it's bonded, you can't get it off. So if I want to use a different yoke or do something different, you can't get it off. It's it's fixed on that frequency or that inductance, and you can't change it. So I've got both. My 20 inch are. are uh, uh, actually, I've got one line of 27s where they're on their permit, and I'd love to get them off because I can use the glass with a different board. But if I can't get the yoke off, I can't make it work. Right. You know. So, so it's it's um, we've done it both ways over the years. We've had you know thousands of both types come in. Um, right now, the the 27s I have are, are all they're all matched with yokes already. Mm -hmm. uh, some are removal, some are not, and then the 20 inch are already matched too. So I don't 
I just did a, a batch of 25 for, uh, um, I think that's who referred you to me. I think it was uh, Texas uh, Museum of Fine Art in Texas or it was somebody else. I can't remember who referred. I can't remember the conversation that got you to me, but um, that one they wanted. A, they wanted a, a different uh, a different input with a different size unit, and the tubes that had already came with a yoke. So I so said, I got to get that off and redo it. So we just had, went through a whole uh, divergence process of getting those set up, and they, they it was a lot of extra work. It's it's really, it's an art more than a science of getting those to match and get it to look right. Yeah. And we used people online that could just they could crank them up three or four minutes, and it probably took me four hours or two to get them lined up because I'm just not I'm not an expert at doing it because it, it's an art form. It's like laying concrete and getting it smooth. You know, you, it's all how many times you do it and get used to doing it. It's, you know what you have to do. It's just how do you do it? In any any profession. So. So I got that done, and we got those out. But yeah, short, long answer. It, it comes both ways. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got the types in stock right now that that I use. And all the monitors you have in stock are all 15 kilohertz. None of them do uh, 480p, 31 kilohertz, or anything like that, right? No, they're all 15, 750. We do have component video that we can do, which is just another approach, but it's the same frequency. We do S video, and then we do composite. So those are the three. Uh, my large flat 27s are the only component, but it's the other smaller 27s and curved and all the other curves that we can do a, a mixture, but the component is strictly in the flat side because that's just what the board set we purchased and, and that's just how we do it. Could you do direct RGB input if you needed to then? Even- we did we do a, we, we did an RGB input on one of our 27s back when, when the video wall processors were still real abundant, people were making those. Mm-hmm. That was a nine pin to nine pin. Well, we want to use one of our lines that was strictly, you know, like a composite input. So the engineers made a kind of a pseudo RGB board that would take the signal, but it actually converts it back to composite. So you're really not getting true RGB, but it allowed you to use the processors. And they did the processing on a little board, but eventually had to go in because you have to set that up on the board. Now, we do have a 27 inch line that we did was strictly RGB mm-hmm. uh, for the industry. So I can still do a few of those. Uh, you know, I, maybe a couple, three dozen, maybe I could put together and, and do a true RGB version, but they'd be spending because they're built from scratch. It would be a complex process, but it can be done. I just, the, the 20 inch, so I'll show you the one, one I just show you. This, is, this, is, this is the board that we, we, we manufactured here. Uh, and that's all built by scratch. Every component soldered by hand, and it's all put together. And this drives our 20 inch product. Well, this product could also do RGB. Okay. So. We can change the back panel to get your nine-pin input, uh, and then. Uh, but it would take it would take some work to do. You got it's it's kind of on the board already. Mm-hmm. So this this is and we, we Dotronic switched over from really a lot of our own manufacturing to uh, buying off a of subcontract. We we went into the uh, one of our one of our uh, one of our engineers actually used to work for uh, used to work for Zena down in Chicago. Hmm. He came work for us. We had a direct in link to to to. Um, uh, to Zenith at that point, so we started buying boards off their line from Mexico. That's kind of that's kind of how I had all this inventory. We were buying you know thousands a month to support injury. Then it just quit. So we always had this. So I've got a, a stock of Zenith boards that won't handle RGB, but so we'd have to build our own, which we still do some of that. So it, it's kind of a mixed bag what people need and and. Uh, but uh, it can be done. The short answer is we can still do RGB. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense because uh, most of these museum installations need CRTs, but they don't need anything past composite video. They wouldn't They wouldn't know what to do with it because the devices they use and the art that it was built for, well, I mean, it's not yeah. about that. So. I always thought it was strange. I've got, I've got a little bit. I used to have some uh, VGA, SVGA, XGA units in stock. We used to build some. Uh, mainly for the airports, they converted, you know, they went, their FID systems went up to the, a higher frequency. We were doing that for a while. And uh, I had them for years. And there's, no, I always kept, I got these and figured that if somebody's got to be driving computers and want to do a CRT, because they were, they were in existence for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's nothing. So I finally just recycled them off and got rid of them because it just was taking up room. And I had to keep the stuff, you know, I, space, you know, I got to store the stuff and all that. So it's, there, there's a, there's a way to run the business. It's kind of a weird business, but you got to run it and still got to make it balanced, you know, so. Yeah. So I, I can't keep everything. I'd love to be able to keep buildings full of stuff, but you, you just... You, I, I know the feeling. Like, I can't tell you how many times I passed up. The one that still haunts me is I stumbled across the listing of a pallet of brand new Sony PVM medical monitors. And the whole yeah, yeah. pallet was like $1,000. And I said, oh, you know, I'm going to get tons of deals like this. I don't have any room for it. And I just, that was, <laughs> drives me nuts. Brand new, still in the box. So yeah, I know the feeling. At the time, it, it doesn't make sense. Why would I keep all this? Why would I waste all this space in my warehouse? And then you, and looking back, it's, oh, I don't know. Maybe I missed an opportunity. Well, I was given an opportunity back well, about over 10 years ago 
because I was still buying directly from Zenith. If they said, okay, we have we have 1,200 of this particular CRT board combination still that, we're, that we produce for you know the hospitality industry left in stock, and after that, we're going to draw a line in the sand, and everything's going to go in the trash. We won't even take a phone call for a part. I mean, it is done. I mean, it, it was just trash it because they're going flat panel. Mm-hmm. So I, I went off and bought as much as I could. So I wish I had all 1,200 sitting on the shelf right now, but, you know, they, I couldn't afford them. Yeah. You know, there's a limit on budget and space, and, I, you know, the, what I purchased was gone in a year. You know, so, it, it, again, that's that, that vision looking forward, and it, it's tough when it's a rare market like this, you know, who wants this stuff? Right. You know, back then, it was still kind of a it was, for for Dotronics, it was still kind of a new market in 06, 7, 8. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And plus, we had this the big you know the Great Recession going on, so it's like, oh, how much do I invest, and in, are they going to come? And you know, hindsight says, yeah, I should have took the whole works and just been I should have been going crazy acquiring more stuff, but I can only acquire what I could afford to hold and, and pay for it. and to store. I think it's it's easy to forget how much it costs to store something, even if you own your own building, because, yeah, you know, if you bought everything and let's say it was a hundred grand worth of stuff and you end up not using it, that that's really bad. But if you're using up half your warehouse storing yeah. that stuff that that money that you lost on parts is actually going to be a lot less than what you would have using that for other things and i think that's what yeah. a lot of people even in collecting this stuff is you know you'd have to have a basement filled with crts and then what's going to happen what's going to happen if, if something happens and you know i'm not around anymore do you think anybody's going to go through that basement and make sure all those crts get parted out no so they're going to go to a recycling facility so it's just gonna yeah call call one eat hunter i got junk you know yeah exactly <laughs> so. But yeah, no. So that's that's the same thing. I guess my father passed, and it's like, oh, his stuff's just kind of sitting. But I, I'm in the business, so I kind of pick and choose and kind of cannibalize that as I need it. But yeah, here I, I finally I moved the business to to actually my residence, hmm. and there's a large outbuilding at my residence. And I wanted to move it there because I just in the last few years of the company, I wanted to kind of simplify things, and and uh, I've just about got the move. It's taken two years. I don't have it done yet because of business, but I almost got it where it's in this facility now. And uh, it worked out great. So it just sits here and I can store it. I don't have this exorbitant cost to, to pay for rent and taxes and insurance to, to holes and stuff. It's just part of my housing cost now, which is great. So it's, that helped keep it going along. You know, I can let it sit forever and it, won't, it really doesn't cost much because I wouldn't rent out my facility at my house. Right. It's fine. It's just I foregoing, hey, I, I can't get my boat and all these RTVs or whatever I might want to own someday. I can't get it in there because it's almost CRTs. So it's so funny because at least in the U.S., anybody that lives in the Midwest is probably nodding, going, that makes sense. And everybody that lives in a city like me is going, wait a minute, you have enough room on your property for a whole other building? <laughs> so it's a, yeah, I've got, I've got 4,000 square feet of storage next to my house. Mm-hmm. So I think I have four square feet of storage in my Manhattan apartment. So <laughs> yeah. I'm on two and a half acres and it, it, it's a, it's absolutely goldmine how I, I found this. It just fell in my lap and. I filled it up and I took eight, ten truckloads of stuff and just filled it to the rafters and and uh, I just recycled about ten thousand dollars worth of glass that I couldn't use. It was just stuff that was wore out or scratched or something I couldn't use. So I, during this pandemic, I had a, about a ninety-day reprieve of just no phone calls, no emails. And I'm cleaning the shop because I don't have time otherwise. So so now I'm at the point where I can think I can get it all under one roof and then that'll be as I whittle that down, that'll start opening up space and that's I've got. Lots of things going on right now that we'll start taking some of this out of here, so that'll be good. So very cool. So uh, a couple of random questions. I was just going through your website, and you you offer these with and without speakers. Um, right. And one of the things that, uh, uh, for whatever reason, on all of my setups, when I got the more higher end stuff, I always had external speakers underneath it, and I never had a problem. And but you know, if it, I've had a lot of people complain about speaker positioning next to a tube how you get the different uh, the color issues uh even with some of the more professional monitors are there like general tips you could give people on speaker placement how you get your monitor your speakers in your monitors without interfering with the uh, you know the display signal at all or anything well it depends how the thing with the speaker is is the is the cone magnet in the speaker that you're dealing with that's anything that's magnetic Especially if you've got a metal cabinet, uh, you know there's all those all the issues about degaussing metal and making sure. And you really don't you don't demagnetize. An engineer taught me this one time. You don't really use a degauss coil around the CRT. Normally, color CRTs it's, it's strictly only a color problem. The monofilm doesn't have the issue. So, but um, you end up you end up uh, degaussing the, the, CR, the color CRTs themselves have a degauss coil, and that's only for the slight anomalies around the metal band that holds the CRT from imploding. Mm-hmm. Correct. I guess you'd say so. Um, the uh, and 
what you normally do is is that's to, to uh, it all goes into uh, purity of, of the monitor. The purity of the monitors is 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 affected by magnetic fields. That's why flat panels don't have any. They, they don't deal with electron gun. Right. You'll never. So it's all those problems that these people have are, are gone. So, so what they end up doing is, if you have too large the speakers too close to the to the deflection yoke or the CRT itself, you're you're going to bend the beam. Mm -hmm. That magnetic field is going to pull that beam one way, to, and that's when you're going to start seeing color variation. Because again, the three beams got to line up with the three holes to give you RGB. You know, right. to give you give you white essentially if they're all on. So, um, our speakers that we put in the cabinets. Are flush against the side. They go on the sides, and they're, and they're pretty small speakers. They're not real big, heavy duty, you know, big 15 inch woofer type speakers or something. That would have. So generally, you shouldn't have a whole lot of effect. Uh, some CRTs are more susceptible to it, depending on how they're designed. But for the most part, uh, the speakers we put in are, are relatively small. They, they can be loud, but they don't have they don't have to have these huge magnets that are going to interfere. And generally, what you do with when you when you degauss a cabinet or, or CRT, especially externally. Um, you're not demagnetizing the metal. All you're doing is realigning the magnetic particles within that steel. Mm -hmm. It's still magnetized. It's just now they go with the beam instead of across the beam. So they're, you don't have any effect of bending the beam. It's all goes straight. So that's why when we degauss these, that's, but you can, you can degauss them one direction facing the north, south, center, and then you turn it 90 degrees, you're going to, the Earth's magnetic field is going to make the change on. So you really got to get them where they're going to be, especially if you degauss them, and then they'll be fine. Yeah. But then move them. So there's always that need. But so, as far as speakers, you know, if, if they're not right up against the CRT or degauss coil, I mean uh, the deflection coil, you're not gonna, you shouldn't see much interference unless it's just, you know, you know, like I got up in the corner, I got you know, big 18-inch woofer on the speaker for the building, so I can, I can, you know, fill the building with music when I'm just working. But <laughs> so, but otherwise, that's you know, that you shouldn't have, shouldn't be a whole lot of interference, you know, unless you're, unless you're dealing, doing something that's relatively larger, has a big magnetic field that would get into the glass. Mm. It's funny because I had a 32-inch consumer TV with speakers in it, um, and every, it was on a, a rolling cart, and everything's fine, works good, and all of a sudden, it's, I see a purple splotch in the lower right corner of it, and I went, oh no, I just recapped this whole thing, what happened? And then I, I, I moved it, and the, the purple tint moved, and I went, is my speaker for my stereo affecting this from a foot away? And I, it was. All I had to do was move it away. And then the opposite, I had a, a mini arcade machine, and I replaced the, the speaker was slightly in front and on top of the CRT, the, the glass part. So imagine, you know, the look of an arcade machine. It was in that top part. And I replaced it with a much better speaker with a giant magnet on the back. Zero change in color. Nothing. It had no, no effect on it. So I was always wondering, like, why, why does something that already has magnetic speakers in it get affected just because it goes by a, a wooden speaker and other ones I could put that speaker right there and it doesn't have any effect on the picture at all. It all depends on how the magnets and that thing is designed and the direction they're pointing and it, it, those magnetic, magnetic cone, the, 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 the magnets in the speaker have obviously characteristics which way the, the magnetic particles are aligned too so if it's aligned with it you will, if it's perpendicular it's going to push on it so you're getting into some science that's beyond me, but it, it I, you, you generally want to keep anything that magnetic away. Like I've had them use electric forklifts to move my monitors, and they get there and they're just destroyed magnetically. I mean, it, mm. it, it takes a while to get them cleaned up because they don't realize that. And I had a museum uh, in New York that had a subway that was um, above or below. I can't remember if it was above or below. Anyway, it was like six stories from where the monitors were, and and when the when the when the uh, subway went by because they're electric motors. Mm -hmm. You should see what it did to the CRT. It's, we have degauss problems all the time because they got these gigantic EMF forces going underneath their building. That's crazy. <laughs> so the, so I, and they they came in. Can we can we shield these monitors to prevent that? You can, but you're you're talking two three thousand dollars a monitor to put shielding on it to try to prevent that interference from hitting the monitor. So that wasn't an option for them, obviously. So they abandoned that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trying to protect against the magnetic field of a small speaker versus the magnetic field of the subway system. Two totally now, different now things. I, I was freaking out. Oh, this is it's, the whole order's done. I'm going to have to pack up, take it home because I can't use it. But it, it ended up the type of work that they put on there. Was so fast and random, you couldn't see the subway go by. It was it was changing. So it was it was just absolute miracle that that's what the artist had on those displays because you couldn't see you couldn't see the effect of the subway. That's crazy. It worked out. It was that I went home with uh, luck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that's the the bane of all CRT uh, enthusiasts is changing out 
bad capacitors after they've either dried out or worse started to leak. Um, you know, I, I obviously you use higher end capacitors in your systems. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to to make them last as long and as durable. Uh, any any thoughts or suggestions on that? Anything that you've stumbled across? Basically, any knowledge you could share with us about that part of it? Well, it's it's the, the ones that really fail are the electrolytic caps. They're they're the ones that have a fluid in them, mm -hmm. the electrolyte that, that that does what it's supposed to do for that capacitor. Uh, and the, the the bigger caps uh, generally will last longer because they're a little better manufactured. But the smaller ones are made pretty inexpensively. Uh, we don't see a lot of a lot of loss in caps. I mean, you're talking really older. It's been used a long time where that has dried out. Uh, we've got electrolytics that have been in the shelf for years. As long as they're stored well and, and, and temperature controlled, they generally will reform uh, once you put power to them. If they don't, you'll know right away, and then they're just junk. But we we don't see a lot of Every now and then we'll see we'll see caps that are dried out or caps that bulge because electrolytes because they, the materials dried up and the, the cap fails. Um, uh, there's no way to say how long a certain cap's going to last or what you can do. You essentially you just got to find replacement capacitors, put them in. Uh, again, Dotronics doesn't see a lot of that. Just I mean, we've had product running 30, 40 thousand hours and the caps hold up just fine. So a part of it's designed to how hard that cap's being driven, you know, and, and all that. So it's hard to give a one answer fits all, but um, uh, generally, if, the, if, if you know the history of the cap and, and where it's been stored and, 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 and it's new when you put it in, it should last an awful long time if the design is, if it's designer, if, if the circuitry is such that uh, certain caps, I've had TVs where the caps go bad and they're just large consumer, tel to television consumers, they, they had to make them as least expensive as possible. It's all about the profit. So uh, the stuff we design, you know, like that board I showed you, that, that's a G10 fiberglass board. All the consumer television. Uh, boards are made out of paper. <laughs> yes, <laughs> layers, layers of paper. Yep. So they don't, so they won't take heat. That thing could take, that'll take heat for decades and doesn't care, and it won't break down. So, but you're paying for it too. You know, you can get a paper phenolic board probably for a dollar and a half, and the fiberglass ones are fifteen dollars. You know, so it, there's a difference, and you can't do that eighty million with a multiplier of eighty million for consumer. It, it, there's too much money there. For us, we can. We're doing you know hundred a year or something. So yeah. we'll put better. Technology, you know, better, better specs, and they'll last a lot longer than so. But I mean, it also, on the flip side of it, it would have been pretty stupid for consumer grade TV manufacturers to spend all that money on something that people are probably going to get rid of every five or 10 years. So it, it was fair. But in, in the experience that I've had and, and my friends have had, uh, I even actually got to interview a few times a, a broadcast monitor technician um, from California who worked on all the Sony PVM and BVMs. And wherever physically the hot spots were, the hottest spots of the input cards, those are the ones to fail most or on things like arcade machines and consumer TVs, like you said, paper boards, whatever. And, you know, I, I just recapped a 32 inch TV and I did it. I did it for educational purposes. It didn't need it. I just I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to get more info for my website. Um, but after I did it, everything looked clearer and better even though it wasn't even in bad shape before then. And, you know, I used the best caps I could find. If something was rated at 50 volts, I'd buy the 65, 75, 100 volt version just in case. Just, you know, so I, I think it, it, there's both sides of that, right? If you have a really good high end piece of equipment, you you might have only a handful of capacitors go wrong after a few years or after, you know, a few decades uh, if there was a lot of heat in it or if, as long as there wasn't a lot of heat in it, I guess. So having a, a professional piece of equipment, it's always you're always going to get more durability out of it, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and even though the, the, the unit boards we purchase are paper for now, like they're designed well, but they still can have some hot spots in certain places. But overall, they're they're well designed because it was more of a, it was more of a commercial grade versus a consumer grade. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. Commercial wants them to last longer. They want to, they don't want to have the phone calls where a consumer they're going to, and the consumer won't use it as much as as as, as the commercial. The consumer actually, the consumer will use it more actually than commercial. Like say in hotel hospital, they, they're they're off most of the time, so they'll last forever. I mean, they just don't have any time on them. So um, I've seen, I've had consumer tellers that I can see where the hotspots are and the electrolytics are failing. It's just obvious, just the way they design them. It's the least expensive design as they can get in there to get it out. Like you say, and it's probably a throwaway after five or 10 years, you know? Yeah. So what you're seeing in my panel, same thing, you know, it's mm -hmm. just going to be the least expensive thing they can do. And off it goes when it's done. You know? Yeah. I've only repaired one flat panel. I replaced the capacitors and the power board. And I, you know, I yep. took out the uh, the five cents a piece caps. Even some of the bigger ones were, were pretty low quality, and I put good stuff in there, and it's still going. But I'm even wondering if that was worth the fifty dollars worth of caps and two hours of my time, you know. But you yeah, know. yeah, 
it won't get to a point where you can depend on what what the panel is and how old it is. And, you know, is it worth replacing versus putting it? But if you got the time and you enjoy doing it, what, what it doesn't make a difference. Exactly, you know? yeah. So um, now, do you only sell commercially or would you sell individually if there's a, a, an enthusiast with, you know, with, with deep pockets? Because these are not cheap pieces of equipment. I think we've been pretty clear as to why these aren't cheap pieces of equipment. But would you sell directly to any gaming enthusiast that really wanted uh, one of these monitors for their setup? I, certainly, yeah. Yeah, I still, I don't have, mainly it goes to, it goes to commercially, you know, the museums and, mm-hmm. and that they're really the, the large, large can color primary in the museum industry. They're the ones that really have the demand because they have a need for it that they can't replace. You know, mm-hmm. so it, everybody else had a need for it other than gamers have, have gone flat back. Mm-hmm. You know, I even I actually bought a, uh, uh, I got a guy local, you probably, I don't know his name, but he's real close to my house here. And he, he, he's huge into old pinballs and old arcade games. So I found him on one of our, I think the network neighborhood kind of thing, where the network gets the neighbor puts a, it's kind of a, a, I don't know what they call it, a little social site. Again, mm-hmm. not a social media kind of activity. <laughs> My wife knows more about that. And I found this guy. I said, well, I, years ago, I played the first Mario Brothers game, you know, the stand-up big box with the little levers. And I had a blast doing that in college, and I want another one of those games. So I found this guy just making them. He's making them from scratch. And he put a 19-inch flat panel in there. Because uh. I, I don't want those old CRTs because I know I can't get parts from it. I mean, I know that. I mean, I... And I don't want. I don't have schematics. I don't have the specs. If there's something wrong, my engineer could probably spend weeks figuring it out. But it's not worth it. So I said. So I bought one. So I got this old retro Mario thing, and it's got the same emblems, everything on. So, um, so yeah. They, they have, if there's a need out there for a CRT, it would fit. You know, mm-hmm. then I then uh, there's no issue in selling the product to anybody you know, at this point. So. so at this point, obviously, this is always changing because it's, we're we're dealing with whatever's left over to us. But for arcade enthusiasts. Uh, being able to find CRT replacements that match up with the stuff that's already there or even doing a chassis replacement, that's kind of where everybody's at now. People do swap out with the LCDs, but it's it's kind of frowned upon in our circle because at that point, why not just build build a brand new one from scratch out of wood and using LCD panels? Save yourself the trouble that, of it. That, that's what this guy did for me. Yeah, yeah so exactly. why, why have a 450-pound thing with a, you know, a, a one-and-a-half ounce LCD panel in it? Go just build one from scratch. Don't waste parts from other machines. So yeah. we're, we're still lucky enough to, that there's enough stock left over, especially when people find consumer TVs that have the same tubes as certain arcade machines so we could plug them in. Um, but one thing that is definitely getting harder to find are these high-end professional video broadcast video monitors. Essentially what, what you sell, I mean, higher-end pieces of equipment that are meant for more accuracy so so people that are really enthusiasts can get them and the prices i've seen on ebay now are are, to use the word disgusting is an understatement because a lot of the scalpers get on there now and they charge they charge almost what they were new for something that barely even works anymore i mean you can still find good deals i did i just picked up a really nice one a couple months ago last year or something but i think for people that are willing to spend that kind of money for for something that they're going to keep forever. They want a high-end piece of equipment. You know, the same person that wants to buy a an Acura instead of a Honda, right? It's the same thing essentially, but it's not. You know, you want that extra bit to it. I think um, that your monitors would be a really great choice. I do think in the gaming world, though, they're going to want uh, RGB and component. Just components, fine. There's converters there because it's just a mathematical difference. It's not like it's changing the signal. So you can get a RGB to component converter that's perfect, but. Um, but yeah, I, I do think if you have models available now, are they? Um, so, what are available in both the flat glass and the curved glass? Uh, in, in what I can still produce here in the in the uh, the flat glass, as I explained earlier, is, is the only product I make that will have component input on it. Okay, it's got component S video and composite, so it's got three options on the back with stereo on all three of those mm-hmm. stereo audios. That's that. That's the product line there that I'll, that I'll build the longest. That'll have I have the most of those that I can produce yet. Uh, then when you get to the twenty-seven curved, then you get into a little bit of S video component or S video composite option, or just composite only. It depends on what board sets I have mm-hmm. that will match, so I can put things together and make it work. Uh, I got a little bit of twenty-five inch product left. That that's kind of that was kind of the lowest demand and least quantity that I was acquiring, so I don't have a lot of that left. And then I do a twenty-inch product. Which is uh, which is uh, this product over the far one over here? Okay. Um, that, that's, uh, that, that. So that's that product over there. So that that twenty inch is is I can still do you know, three four dozen of those yet before I start running into glass. But so I, I have very low quantity of the stuff left that I can produce. But based on my sales demand and my customer base, 
it's probably you know, a couple, three years worth of stock yet before I, it's it just my pure speculation that's where it's going to be unless I come across some more stuff. But uh, again, I can't get flybacks made anymore either over, overseas. It used to be Chung paying all kinds of people to make the high voltage flyback. You, that's a custom molded thing and you, you can't get them. So mm. uh, that's going to be a showstopper. But so those are really, and the, and the, and the, the, the 20 inch, I can do a 20 and a 27 that are RGB. Um, like you showed on that board, I can I can change the heatsink, get a nine pin in that thing, and then we could do RGB. We never did component with our our own product line. It just it wasn't it just wasn't a demand from our customer base because it was an industrial customer base, not a consumer base. So, um, so twenty, twenty five, and twenty seven, you could do RGB if requested. Uh, the twenty five I could not. Okay, twenty five don't have twenty five inch glass that would match. Uh, that I'd have yokes to match to that board. I, the 27, I can still do some RGB curved only, and I can do 20 inch RGB. But they're like I say, they're, those are monumental tasks. Those, those that would, you know, that would be a very expensive monitor. Because you've, you've got a, I may have to make a single heat sink out of a metal shop, and that could, you know, that, that could be 500 bucks just for the heat sink. Mm. So somebody's got to set the whole line up, bend it, punch it, do all the fabrication. Where I used to maybe make a hundred of those, then it, be, then, then they were maybe a fifteen dollar bracket. Right. But the one they got to set the whole line up to make one. So I do have a small metal shop that probably could be less expensive, but you've got to do all that. Then we just hook it up and we could get that. We have the tube yoke and board combo that we could put those together for RGB. So um, what's the the line count difference between the twenty and the twenty seven? Because this is where where line count tends to um, to really I, I don't want to say matter, but make be be as noticeable as you could imagine. So if you have you know, like let's say you have a 400 line uh, line count 20 inch and a 400 line count 27, you're going to notice a lot difference in space. So, or... well, they generally they're they're set up the same way. They're 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 NTSC type picture tube, whether they're 20 or 25 or 27. Mm -hmm. So they should have, in my understanding, they have the same line count. Generally, the max you can get it's about 480 to 525 line count. So, uh, uh, depending on each each tube manufacturer, a little bit different, but that's kind of you. They know you're running 15750. You're running NTS frequency, mm -hmm. so RS 170. So you're not going to get, you're not going to get any uh, uh, more or less line. Lines are fixed. So um, you're right. The smaller, the, you know, you get a smaller tube, it looks much more high res because the lines are just closer together. Right. So, but how you're driving it, if you're driving it true resolution, it's not. It, it, it's going to be the same number of lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. My, is my understanding. I don't believe they, they put more lines in a 20 as they do a 27 or a 25. Well, in the, uh, you know, and a lot of this is all marketing too, but in the professional and broadcast monitor world, these, they published line counts with each different model. So you can get three different 20 inch monitors. Some of them have 600, 800 or 900 lines in each one. Uh, and if you go up, if you just have a macro camera and you take a picture of this, the same screen on all three, you'll notice more vertical, uh, vertical lines in between all of them. So. That but it can't be the same picture tube. Uh, uh, it, usually the Sony's, the aperture grills. Changing the picture tube to get those lines in color glass. It's triads. You you can't if you if you've got you know, 640 by 480, you can't change those lines. You, you can sure drive it harder, but you're not going to get any more lines than that 680 mm -hmm. by 480. It just it just isn't going to happen because it's it's a mechanical shadow mask that's in those glass tubes. And from my understanding, you, you can't change that. So I, I know we've played with that over the years in Dotronics, and you. You can bring the frequency up, but you just don't. It just doesn't. You're not getting more lines. So if you've noticed, the, if you have a different line count on those in their color glass, they've added more lines to, to the glass. glass. Right. Yeah. Exactly. To the glass. Right. Yeah. So in mine, you can't do that. Mine, mine all have the same line count because the, the shadow masks are fixed. So I don't. I don't have three different twenty inch. And I do have actually. I do have a about four. Uh, higher resolution uh, 20 inch CRTs, which I got boards and drives, but that it's on the VGA site. Now you need more lines, so they have to give you more. If they don't give you the, the triads and the lines, you can't get it out of the board. It's not going to display it. So now, it's can, different. Monochrome's a whole other animal. That you can, right. it's, it's a limit there. You get one tube, you can do what you, uh, based on the gun. You have to have the gun that can, has a capability of doing that. So, hmm. And the, the 20 inches that are VGA, are, there, are they only the higher resolution or will they accept NTSC 15 kilohertz as well? They're 31.5's bottom, so okay. it's VGA only. And I, I think it's VGA, I, I, I haven't built them for 20 years. I know I got the boards in the shelf and the tubes and the oaks. I, I'd have to find the metal off, but they, they are 20 inch. I know they're 20 inch VGA. They're, we had a Taiwan plant at one time over in, uh, in Taiwan that made a lot of our product. When we acquired a company, we got a, we got a really nice facility there years ago. 
it's no longer there, but that's where a lot of that stuff, our facility there would buy the stuff and ship it to us. So we had almost like a buying arm in Taiwan for all the stuff we wanted here. So um, that's long gone, but I, I did keep them because I knew they were in great, the tubes were brand new, the boards were good. So it's about bolting them together and make them work. So I've, I've got, I think, four or six of those around the plant that are could be built at some time. So I just, I didn't throw them because they're so, they're, they're in immaculate shape. I hate to get rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was one thing I was always confused about with, with VGA monitors, let's just say, right. Even your standard off the, off the shelf ones, why wouldn't they work with the, the lower frequency? Is it just the electronics aren't programmed because there are tri-sync monitors that'll do 15, 24 and 31 kilohertz. Is it, if the electron, if the electronics are set up, they'll do that. We have auto sync monitors. All your flat panel monitors are auto sync. Right. All the desktops. If you can do, you know, six forty all the way up to whatever the twenty one hundred lines, are, and you can do that, but you only have so many lines on your LCD. So it, it, they, they they'll take the frequency, but they're only going to display. Right. They make it smaller, but it gets fuzzy. If you know, if you get higher res, it can get more fuzzy because you don't if you don't have if you don't have the the base resolution is not there. Um, so it, it, you can you can certainly drive it if the electronics will accept it. So, but well, you can display it is another story. Right. You know, you, you, so we we made one of the first auto sync color or monochrome monitors that would go from 15 to 31 kilohertz because our customers had all these different frequencies and they wanted to monitor to lock in at each one of those. And we did that. We made it. It was a huge product for us for years through the 80s. And that that's before even these multi multi frequency flat panel computer monitors came out. Mm. And now they're now they're dime a dozen, you know. So, um, but yeah, that that you have to have like in this what we have here, it doesn't have the electronics to understand any. You won't it won't lock into anything less than thirty one five. You try to put something lower, it's, it's just going to roll. Right. It's not. It's just it's just not going to understand it because electronics aren't there. So you have to design it to accept the frequencies that you're going to feed it. So you'd, you'd basically have to design a chassis that's able to translate 15 and 31 kilohertz to what the exact flyback and gun is expecting. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. And, and that's, that's, that's a huge, that could take two years to design a board like that yeah. an engineer, and, and hundreds of thousands. So it, unless you're in that business, you can sell lots of that. No one's going to do it. Right. Unless you got a, unless you've got an EE and can sit in your basement and play with it for two years yourself. That's great. But most people aren't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> At least not in my world. I've got a few engineers that can do it, but then you got to buy the components too. You got to be able. So, in the world today, that's not likely ever going to happen. Right. You know? I even place where I buy flybacks in the U.S. because I buy parts of them. Mm -hmm. And the guy told me that all of the there's no, they have nobody in that facility that can design a flyback for them because they're all retired and they and the new people wouldn't have a clue what that thing even is. They can build the old designs that are there. They can pull the files and build all day. So that's good for me, but. They can't make new ones. That's uh, that's unfortunately not, not. true in every industry too. I was just reading an article about Texas Instruments has a few chips like that, and uh, one of them has a bug that they're just saying, "Here's the bug. We're not fixing it because the people that designed it are all gone, and no one, none of the new people know how to work on it. So it is what it is. It's not worth investing because they're not going to sell any. Yeah, you know, it's all business, all about revenue. So it's, it's I get it. I, we've got a bunch of we got a Panasonic chip that drives these. It drives uh, the twenty inch my twenty inch product over here. That that's got. Uh, a real complex 42 pin chip that does all of the video processing no longer made fortunately i got about a thousand of them on the shelf good so that i i overkill because from the old days so i've got enough to continue i mean to build another hundred of them i got plenty of chips so <laughs> cool yeah well i honestly thank you so much for taking the time to to talk about this uh you're gonna make a lot of people happy talking about all crts and showing off all the stuff that you have um i'll put links to your site and everything for anybody with deep enough pockets to to want to get one of these things for their collection uh and of course you know i'll continue to pass your name along to all the, the different museums i work with because I, I do occasionally get emails from different museums around the country and sometimes around the world even for for people looking for this stuff so we definitely know where yep. to send them now <laughs> yeah no I, i'd say it's it, most my products labeled so let's say the museums all the different curators go to everybody's museum and see what they're doing and look at their artwork and displays and so a lot of that's just word of mouth they get i keep the website up but otherwise it's they pretty much all know me you know they, they know if they're going to get glass they got to call me so it's it's uh, it's it's a weird business i would have you, you you told me 20 years ago i'd be sitting here today doing this i would have lost <laughs> that no way no way anybody could have because you had to be sitting on the stuff too yeah you, know, you couldn't go out and start this business today and start buying. You just can't do it. It's just it's just an anomaly. You know, it, 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 I would have never for. I wish I could say I had foresight, like you know, like the Gates, and I got well, Apple. I got the I got the Windows coming. You know, so <laughs> unfortunately, that's not me. So well, we're all glad you're here, Kurt. So thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it, Bob. So yeah, if, if, if any questions, uh, shoot me a text or email, and 
appreciate talking to you. Thanks very much.